I always like uh, football weekends because uh, we get a lot of people that are coming back to the campus here, and uh, sometimes it gets, we get overwhelmed with the, uh, the amount of uh, folks and, the, and their experiences and their backgrounds and their willingness to uh, engage with our students. So we have to kind of, we're, we're discerning, and we go through and we, uh, we make the best choices and try to, to not overload you guys. So I think we're pretty fortunate today to have Mr. Murdy with us. Uh, he comes uh, with a different background. I mean, he obviously a corporate executive, but a little bit different in terms of the, the, the companies and stuff that he worked with. They're more natural resource oriented and stuff like that. So uh, uh, I think it gives you a, a, an added perspective from a different uh, industry. So on that note, I'm going to go through the, a script here to bio because I can't remember everything on everybody. And I'll try to be brief. Um, again, uh, today's guest speaker is uh, Mr. Wayne Murdy. He is retired now as the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the Newmont Mining Corporation uh, about uh, seven years ago. After 15 years with the company and serving as the Chief Financial Officer and later as President prior to being elected the CEO in 2001. For those of you who may not know, uh, Newmont is a major gold producer. Uh, they have about $25 billion in assets across five uh, continents. They were founded in 1921. Actually, I think the company was founded in 1916. Uh, but as a corporation, they were founded in 1921. I think 1925, they started getting traded on the uh, stock exchange. Um, they are the only gold company that's included in the Standard & Poor's 500 Index and the Fortune 500. Uh, prior to joining Newmont, Mr. Murray spent 15 years in senior financial positions in the oil and gas industry, first with Getty Oil Company and later as chief financial officer of Apache Corporation. He began his business career in public accounting after graduating from the California State University at Long Beach with a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration and as a certified public accountant. So again, a little pitch there for you accountancy majors. You know, there's all kinds of career paths for you out there. Mr. Murdy was recognized, besides just the big four, okay? Mr. Murdy was recognized as a distinguished graduate of his alma mater in 2005 was the 2006 recipient of the Charles F. Rand Gold Medal of American Institutes of Mining, Metallurgical, and Petroleum Engineers. He was awarded an honorary doctorate degree of engineering by the Colorado School of Mines in 2007, and in that year was a recipient of the International Bridge Builders Award by the University of Denver. Mr. Murdy is also a director of BHP Bilton Limited and BHP Bilton PLC, as well as the Warehouser Company. He also serves as a trustee of the Denver Art Museum, the Papal Foundation, Papal Foundation, excuse me, St. John Vianney Theology Seminary, and is a member of the College of Engineering Advisory Council here at the University of Notre Dame. Another unique thing, an accountant. I love it when you see, you know, accountancy students or finance or business students or mar whatever going out and becoming the advisory committee on advisory council to the College of Engineering. I'm an engineer, by the way, so. Um, and I lost my place. Uh, he was a founding member of the Partner, Partnering Against Corruption Initiative of the World Economic Forum. He's a past chairman of the International Council on Mining and Metals and is a past director of the National Mining Association, as well as a former member of the Manufacturing Council of the United States Department of Commerce. Perhaps more interesting to some of you students here is that he has four, he has four children, three of which have Notre Dame degrees two undergraduates, and most recently as his daughter with an MBA. Uh, she finished up here a few months ago, I believe. Uh, and he has six, they, they I should have, uh, his wife is over here. They have six grandchildren, and two of them are freshmen here at Notre Dame, I believe in O'Neill Hall. So if there's anybody here from O'Neill or if they are here, welcome. So anyways, on that note, I don't want to take up any more of his time. Please extend a warm welcome to Mr. Wayne Murray. Thank you very much. Uh, it sounded like a lot of stuff, but you know, I'm 70 years old, so uh, it's been a lot of time that's passed. Uh, uh, when I was, uh, when I turned 60, one something I promised myself, I've, I'm a little bit of a car guy. Is that politically correct? Can I say I'm a car guy? Not hurt, offend anybody. Uh, and so I always wanted a Porsche. And uh, uh, so when I turned 60, I finally, uh, Diana had been saving the nickels for a while, and I finally had 
had a little nest egg aside, and I bought this Porsche, and it goes way fast, way faster than I should ever drive, and, and had all the speed, and I felt pretty good. I just turned 70, and for my birthday, the family bought me a golf cart that has a top speed of 25 miles an hour. <laughs> I think they're trying to tell me something. I'm supposed to slow down a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I like talking to college students. Uh, I really like talking in a small group. This is a big auditorium, but I understand you have a beach ball that you throw around so we can talk uh, to each other. I'm going to go through a bit of my career uh, just to kind of give you some background where I come from. I've, I've been very fortunate. I've had a lot of very different experiences. Uh, I've always operated in the natural resource area. Um, let's see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forget to do this, so I should actually have somebody else clicking this for me if I, if I did this right. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through different stages of my career, and I'd like to spend some time talking about uh, working in the developing world. I've had a lot of experiences internationally. Uh, unfortunately, most of those weren't in the uh, Londons and Parises of the world. They were in places like Uzbekistan or Indonesia or a lot of very difficult places in West Africa, places to work. And I'd like to share some of those experiences with you. And, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about corporate governance. I'm going to cover a spectrum of things. Uh, and then we're just going to open it up. And you will just, we'll just talk. And so uh, uh, when you're old, you get to share a lot of experiences. You may not be very smart anymore. But uh, that's what I'd like to do today. I, I want this to be as interactive as it can be in a, in a room this, uh, this big. Um, as I said, I, you know, just to give you some perspective, uh, I've worked primarily with large public companies. Um, I started out uh, my career uh, in a management training program. My undergraduate degree was actually in, in marketing. And I worked for a year for, uh, for Atlantic Richfield Company. Um, I was in this program where they moved, moved me around from department to department. And, and as I think about that experience, uh, I was working with a lot of people that were working to make a salary and didn't have a lot of, uh, I'm going to say, joy or, or pleasure in their job. I'm, I'm always struck. I was in an accounting group for about three months, and it was like a big old-fashioned classroom. There was uh, desks that we each worked at, and the supervisor sat at the front of the room, you know, facing us. And at 4.25, uh, everybody would stop working, they would clear their desk, the desk had to be perfectly clear, and then they would watch a clock on the wall uh, tick off until 4.30. And at 4.30, everybody get up and run for the elevator. That impacted me in a, in a, in a funny way. And I thought, boy, what a, that's, that's not a very good way to, to live. Um, I never, I, never, uh, I never set out to be a, uh, uh, to be a CEO. Uh, I came from a pretty modest background. But I just, I, I was taught that you, you worked hard. And, uh, and so that was, uh, I, I think, what really drove me when I, when I started to get a good job. But I stayed at Atlantic Richfield for only about a year. And then, uh, then moved on to Arthur Anderson and Company. And my, my older brother really influenced me. He said, you know, you'll get to do a lot of different things. You'll see a lot of different companies. And, uh, uh, and you'll, and you'll um, uh, and it'll really develop your career. I had no desire to be a, a, a CPA or to, uh, uh, to work in public accounting for a long period of time. I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll do that for three or four years and I can land a a good job that I can stay at for the rest of my career. So that was really, really my goal. Um, I put some points up here, and, and uh, let me touch base on a couple on a couple of things. And that that is, uh, uh, let's see, I get lost here a little bit. You're learning now. You're getting th so many things thrown at you. But when you get in a job, that's when the real learning starts. Uh, it's not presented to you. You don't just get to read about something and do it. Uh, but 
And so I, I really preach, especially to business people, when you get in the workforce, learn about that company. Really try to understand the operations side of it. There's a lot of different ways you can go in your career. But I think trying to understand the whole company and what makes it successful. And the operations side is where the rubber meets the road, almost irregardless of what the industry is. And so get out of that, uh, that comfortable seat, walk around. If you can get plant tours, if it's a manufacturing company, uh, uh, you can get out in the field to different operations. Uh, really inter inter interject yourself in that. I'm going to try not to be too preachy in this uh, presentation in the first part, but, I but it, you're going to hear me talk a lot about understanding operations. The other thing that I learned very quickly in my career is being a professional sounds great. Uh, it really means you've got to do uh, what it takes to produce a good product. And you can't, talking about that clock, you can't do it you know, in eight hours and punch the clock and walk out the door. If it's going to take 12 hours, it's going to take 12 hours. Uh, the important thing, and if you can do it in three, and then, then get, get it done in three. Uh, it's all about really caring about what you're producing and why you're producing it. Uh, and doing it with the best, the best of your ability. Uh, time is your most important asset as a human being. Think about that. That clock is running, and we only have so much of it. So whether you've got a huge balance sheet or not, the most valuable asset you have is your time. So make sure you're doing things that you enjoy. Uh, I always told my employees, if you don't like your job, quit. I mean, if you're a regular working person, you're going to put more time into your job than almost any other single thing you do. Uh, you probably put more time in it than you sleep, especially if you're a college student. Uh, but uh, if you don't enjoy that, you're, you're robbing your life. So have the courage to go after what, what turns you on, what you have a passion about. So, you know, and if you can't find, if you're working in a job just for that payroll, you're going to be a very unhappy person, I think. And get that balance right. Uh, I always think back, I got very involved at Arthur Anderson. I worked a lot of hours. I started out, I was kind of at the bottom of the rung, and I enjoyed some success there. And ended up working there a lot longer than I planned. Ended up uh, nine years, and I was on the verge of making partner, and I realized I really wasn't doing what I wanted to do. I always said I wanted to do deals, uh, not review deals. But uh, it was taking a toll at home. And I remember when my wife finally told me, you know, you're not happy, you're getting sick, I was working, I remember one year I had 2,700 chargeable hours. You know, that doesn't count the administrative time. It was crazy. But they'd give it to you. You need to know how to balance that. So think about that as you're, as you're working. I always say there's no shortcuts. There's many different paths to the top. Um, and uh, take advantage of getting out of your comfort zone. A couple of formative experiences I want to tell you about. Uh, obviously, I'm a big fan of the time I did spend in public accounting. It taught me one thing, and that is, you know, in school, they, get, they lay it out for you, and here's the problem, and here are the facts. Uh, when you're in the workforce, don't accept uh, those facts. Look behind them. Have a sense of whether what you're what you're getting makes sense before you form a conclusion. An important ingredient in, in a professional's life, I think, is something called what I call intellectual honesty. Look hard at the information. Form your conclusion. Don't get influenced by emotion. Don't get influenced by the answer you think your boss wants to hear. I think that's one of the great mistakes people make. Uh, I was talking to somebody earlier today, and they said there's a study about students that, that are straight-A students. A lot of times, they get very good at understanding what their professors want and delivering that. Uh, that's fine, 
When you're in the workforce, you're being paid to look at the, at the facts and present your best conclusion as to what, uh, what that implies. Second very formative experience for me was in the mid-70s, uh, and it kept me in public accounting two more years than I planned. I ended up on an assignment uh, where I was involved in the uh, Lockheed bribery scandal, the investigation of that. Uh, Lockheed Aircraft Corporation was the largest defense contractor in the country uh, in, the, in the 70s. They were under some financial pressure. They'd uh, come out with a with a new air, commercial aircraft, the L-1011, which wasn't very successful. They had a very large uh, contract to deliver the C-5A, a heavy lift air, aircraft, to the, uh, to the uh, Air Force, and it had fallen behind, and they, they were in a lot of trouble. Uh, they got involved in order to sell planes internationally to, uh, they got involved in bribery. When I say bribery, uh, this, this hit the, uh, hit the lights. They were, uh, the board of directors was required to, uh, to run an uh, uh, internal investigation. They, were hi they hired uh, an outside law firm, Sherman and Sterling, from New York, and uh, Arthur Anderson, two firms that did not normally do work. Uh, we reported directly to the board of directors, and it was about a two-year uh, assignment. What I took away from that is uh, we interviewed a lot of people. We went all over the world. We saw, saw a lot of circumstances. Uh, when you talk about corruption, it's, it's, a, it's a very wide berth. I mean, at one end, it's the out and out. You know, you think about somebody handing, a, handing money over in a black, uh, in a black case to, uh, uh, to somebody to, uh, to get a contract. At the other end of it, you see countries where it's almost extortion. In order to do business, money had to be paid. We saw the full spectrum of that. What struck me at that, uh, out of that experience, though, was two things. One term that we hear a lot about these days, tone at the top. The tone at the top there was get the sale. Okay. The other thing was the human tragedy of this. We interviewed very senior, very um, committed workers. Uh, that was a workforce that was extremely smart. They were the high-tech company of its day. They were producing the U-2 aircraft and sp uh, spy satellites and all this super secret stuff in their skunk works. Really hardworking engineers that had come up through the ranks because it was primarily an engineer-driven company, and they got caught up in this. They all individually knew it was wrong, but you'd sit and talk to these people and they thought they were doing the greater good for their company by participating in this. And in their gut, they all knew it was wrong, and it tore them up. And I saw that human tragedy, and it really struck with me, stuck with me. Uh, nobody pays you enough money to buy uh, your morals or your values. I used to always tell my employees, you get put in these positions, it's way above your pay raise to make those decisions. And I think it behooves it on the senior management of a company to constantly reinforce that fact with their employees that they are not made, they are not paid enough to make those decisions. Uh, you get down that path, it's, it's a very, very slippery slope. At that point in time, I got my first exposure to international business, and, uh, and especially in the developing world, and you realize how difficult uh, those are. I'll come back to some of those. Um, a deep, and I'm going to drive it again, a deep understanding of the operations of a company will drive good strategy. Uh, I saw that uh, in an assignment with Getty Oil Company after I left Arthur Anderson. I went to Getty Oil Company, which had been one of my clients. I thought I'd work there the rest of my life. Some very interesting experiences and, and uh, very fortunate. Um, and uh, Diane and I moved to, uh, uh, to Denver, Colorado in 1981. I was transferred to an operating unit. And uh, this was a, uh, a unit that was basically involved in pipelines and transportation. But I worked for some people that really understood their industry deeply. I'm not a big fan of the GE model 
that uh, every couple of years you get promoted and, and a manager is a manager and can work anywhere. I think you have to throw yourself into an industry and really understand it if you want to be successful. And good strategy comes from that real understanding of the full ramifications of a, uh, uh, of a company, how it operates, and of an industry. I also at Getty saw how a CEO's ego uh, got in the way and actually lost a good company. Uh, There's a lot of change going on after Mr. Getty died and uh, you ha suddenly had a professional management in the organization. This is a very large oil company, very successful, very profitable. Uh, but the CEO started reading his own press clippings and he started getting, it was more important where he went than how he conducted his, his job day to day. So he got very involved in lots of industry organizations, um, uh, you know, international uh, uh, chamber of commerce, things like that, took his eye off the ball. And he had a group of shareholders and a director who happened to own a very large uh, piece of the company or control a very large piece of the company. And he took his eye off of that. Uh, ego is, is a big, big uh, detriment to good leadership. And yet we see it over and over again amongst leaders. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, some of those things stuck with me for a long time. Uh, in uh, 1986, I, I had the good fortune to be, uh, Getty was acquired by Texaco, the CEO lost the company. I ended up going to work for Apache Corporation as CFO, and I thought, boy, now I've made it. CFO, you know, investment bankers, deals, financings, uh, this is the fun stuff, uh, and it was. And there's a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, opportunities that you're given. You're exposed to a lot of people. I was finally really doing deals. Um, but again, uh, you've got a lot of people trying to push you. And so at this stage, you have to step back and again remind yourself the day-to-day -day stuff really matters. I mean, what gets Trump companies in trouble is when the eye gets off the ball. So uh, doing the day-to-day -day stuff, understanding the cash flows, uh, just those basic things that you've all been exposed to become extremely important. Um, I touch base a little bit about m and an opportunity to, to uh, be involved in a number of those deals. And uh, they're fun. There's no question about it. And you see uh, you see individuals, professionals that get involved and become basically deal junkies. And I totally understand that. It's a, it is a lot of fun. But when you're involved in it, uh, you need to understand why you're acquiring an asset, what the real value is of that asset. Again, you've all heard this. Um, I feel it's very important when you're looking at an asset, at an acquisition, that you can do all the numbers, do all the spreadsheets, understand value, but if you don't see upside in it, stay away from it. There's got to be unquantifiable upside in a transaction or you're probably making a mistake. Nobody's stupid out there. Uh, you'll get to within a value range that either makes, makes sense and a transaction gets done uh, or you won't. But more than 50% of major Mergers and acquisitions, there's a lot of studies on this, are, are failures. They do not add to shareholder value. So you do the numbers, you understand when to walk if you can't get it done, but in the back of your, of your pocket, you better be able to see some, some value there that's not, that you can't put a number on, but, you, but, but it's, it's tangible enough that your gut tells you it's there and it can be extracted. Sometimes it's synergies. Sometimes it's a, a discovery that, uh, that hasn't been uh, uh, fully exploited. It can be a lot of different things. Uh, in 2002, when I was at Newmont, uh, we made an acquisition of an Australian company, Normandy Mining. We were buying it for its, its, its assets in Australia. We wanted more exposure in the developed world because we had a lot of exposure in the undeveloped, so our political risk profile was, was out of sync a bit. Um, 
in that acquisition, there were assets in other parts of the world that this company owned little bits and pieces of. And I always remember when we made our presentations to, uh, to the investors and uh, to the analysts, we always said, we're buying it for this purpose. Here's the value that we see in it. Here's the upside we see in it. We have these other assets around the world. We're going to be selling those. One of those assets was an exploration play in Ghana. Um, Newmont had operations in the United States. We're going into Australia. We're in Canada. But we had big exposures in Indonesia and uh, Peru and Uzbekistan. And we kind of had a, enough, if you will, high risk for our portfolio. So the Ghana was identified early on as something that we would sell. Um, our exploration has said, let us drill a little bit on this. It looks pretty interesting. That'll increase the value for when you sell it. That asset now is one of the highest value assets in Newmont. As we drilled on it, we found more and more gold and uh, ends up being a really key asset. So having those other options out there really drove that acquisition. We got what we thought we were paid for, but the upside was there and really justified uh, the acquisition. I, turn, I talk here a little bit about learning how, oh, sorry. You got it? OK, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, we can just go back one a minute. Talk a little bit about the art of managing up. You've got to be able to sell these things in, a, in, a, in an organization. And uh, that means, obviously, getting the CEO on board if you're in a development group. And a lot of you, if you're uh, MBAs, you end up be, being in development groups and companies, so you'll look at a lot of M&A. You've got to understand how to present that information. And I, I say manage up, uh, sell up, so you can get people excited about it. So again, you, ne you need to understand the brutal facts. Uh, but you, be, you need to be able to sell it, and you need to be able to convince the board of directors that they should take, uh, take the step, because these are high risk. OK. Uh, let me talk a little bit about then, you know, being a CEO and what I, what I think it means. And I am a, a big fan of uh, Jim Collins' book, Good to Great. Uh, and there's a couple things in there that, that hit me. I'm not a big fan of a lot of business books. That one's pretty simple to read. It's straightforward. It's got some very basic lessons in it. Um, leadership is talked about, and there's a lot of, uh, of examples of successful leadership. And in that book, uh, I'm sure many of you read it, uh, they talk about level five leaders. Level five leaders are just that. And when there's problems, they take the blame. When there's glory, they share it. It's not something we see a lot in the world today. Everybody likes to uh, you know, spike the ball in the end zone and attract attention when good things happen. Uh, it is, if you're leading an organization, it is important that I think that the bad news moves up that organization's chain of command as, good, as fast as the good news. Uh, and that's, I think, a vitally important thing. I talk about the biggest challenge is getting the right people on the bus. Your leadership team is key to the success of the company. And dealing with people is the hardest job any manager has. Uh, by far, it's the hardest job you have, because you're dealing with people that have been in career positions for a long period of time. They're reasonably successful. But that team has to work as one. And I think uh, you see too many newly minted CEOs that just inherit an organization and just try to keep it moving. First thing, and I think the most important thing a CEO does, is getting the right people on the bus. Uh, and that means making some hard personnel decisions. There's a way to deal with that. It's not about being brutal with people by any means. But you have to make sure that you're all working together. You guys have a fantastic example of that in this institution. When you talk about your, your, your top three leaders in this organization with Father Jenkins, uh, John Affleck Graves, and uh, Tom Burrish, I understand that when they get behind closed doors, they can have pretty fierce meetings with one another. 
but they are all on the same page. They have the same goals for this organization, and they speak as one when they speak externally. And I think that's vitally important. So I think the number one lesson that I learned as a CEO is get that team that are, that's around you right from the beginning. Um, hire people that are smarter than you if you can. Uh, again, ego gets in the way here a lot of times. But if you can surround your people that are, that are smarter than you are, that is a, uh, that's a, a good thing and a, and a good crutch. Um, tone at the top, be clear and direct with people. Again, easy to say. It means you've got to communicate over and over and over again. We all overestimate how people understand us. We have a lot of information up here. Getting it to come out and really communicate with people is hard. So I, I try to push that. Uh, don't overestimate. Uh, their understanding of what, uh, what you're trying to communicate. And here again, I talk about bad news should move fast. Um, the other key thing, lesson that I learned as a CEO is taking time to think. Scheduling time when that door's closed and you can just sit back and mull over a wide variety of topics within the organization. And that means you've got to take control of your calendar. Uh, in senior management positions, everybody wants your time. And, and if you let them control your time, all you're going to do is be a reactive manager. You need to have time where you can sit down and think. And I actually would schedule that time. I mean, you know, you hear the stories about having a great idea in the shower, and that's fine. But you can't always count on that. And if you can just take a little time, close the door, uh, put the word out not to be disturbed, that is uh, one of the most valuable assets that you can provide uh, to, your, to your organization. Uh, you know, we hear a lot about understanding the risks of the organization. You constantly have to look at uh, the company you operate uh, in with that mindset of what can go wrong uh, because, because things will happen no matter how strong a team you have, no matter how good an organization. Um, uh, don't overestimate uh, what's out there. There are a lot of negative things that will happen and you need to be able to, to deal with those when they, uh, when they come up. So understanding risks and what can possibly go wrong and how you might react to that is a, is a trait that I think you try to push throughout the organization. You want to push that down to the lowest level so your plant supervisors, if you're in that kind of business, uh, are thinking about uh, what can go wrong and how you, how you react to that, how you mitigate those risks. Now I'd like to spend a little bit of time, I'm going too long, on operating in the developing world. And uh, this is, uh, uh, this is a, uh, I mean, it's a natural resource business. Uh, you're, uh, if you're in a mining business, you're going to be subject to lots of criticism. But I have to tell you, in my career, I took more personal pleasure out of, out of operating in some of these places. We're typically the first industrial activity in an area. Uh, so you're suddenly dealing with subsistence farmers and fishermen, uh, and you're teaching them a trade. You're doing you're changing people's lives in, a, I think, a very positive way. And there's a way to get that right. And if you get it right, it's, it's a rewarding experience. But there's a lot of challenges. I mean, there's community expectations when you go in and you're going to build the facility. Um, you're dealing with an unskilled workforce for the most part. You're dealing in an, in an environment where there's constantly changing laws and regulations. It's, uh, it's not stable. Uh, it seems like the more successful you become, the tougher, tougher things get. Logistics are tough. Corruption is out there, and it's on many levels. And, uh, and it doesn't always just hit you uh, in the face. It can be very subtle. And so, again, that tone at the top and how you operate, how you play, play the game is as important as, as, uh, uh, as what the goals are. Um, Lots of, lots of pressures from lots of uh, areas. Uh, next slide on, on uh, 
risk mitigation becomes extremely important, and there's a lot of ways to do that. Uh, at Newmont, when we operated in a developing country, uh, we would typically try to uh, involve a multilateral agency in the financing of the project. Uh, so whether it was a uh, uh, IFC arm of the World Bank or uh, a, uh, uh, one of the uh, export credit agencies, there's lots of these uh, places you can go to obtain financing. And the reason we did that, financing was typically expensive, but it provided uh, a, a sense of risk mitigation in that that multilateral agency had sway in that country that uh, much larger than what your sway might be. Uh, so uh, when those rules started to change, you had the opportunity to, um, um, to lean on Big Brother, if you will. And uh, whether it was the World Bank or not, they had sway or they had influence in that country way beyond what you did. So keeping that country to, f to follow the contract that was entered into was very, uh, was very important. Um, I had a picture up here a minute ago from Ghana. It was the last slide. But some of the difficulties, and that slide illustrates it. Uh, I'm sitting talking with the president. That was at the inauguration of the of a mine there. We were dealing with the formal government, but there's also the king of the Ashante tribe that's shown in that picture, decked out in gold. We knew we were in the right country because of all the gold he had on. But uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, that government was really split. You had the formal government and the informal government. And the, uh, uh, the elders and the uh, uh, the royalties of the tribe really controlled the land, the surface of the land. So we had to deal with both, and they didn't necessarily like each other. Uh, so you get caught in a lot of this type of situation where you really have to listen a lot more than you talk and understand uh, how, to, uh, how to work through those situations. Um, as I said, if you get into one of these situations, and you do it right, and you get it right, and it's hard. Uh, I mean, think about going into an area, opening up a mine in an area where there's nothing but subsistence farming. You start hiring people. You start having a positive influence on the communities around that mine. Uh, we teach people trades. Uh, we have a program at Newmont where we had nine trades that we taught people, and they were things like electricians and technicians and mechanics. Uh, it's a formal program. It's a four-year program. Uh, we, would, we would go out and do aptitude tests, hire people, um, good-paying jobs, had to be in, within the right range. But suddenly, you're changing the dynamics of that whole community. Uh, you're breaking the poverty cycle, that's good, but how far does that reach? So you influence this village, but maybe you're not influencing this village. You suddenly start causing jealousies. So it's very, very difficult. It's something that the simple miners or simple finance people, uh, there's, there's skills and uh, disciplines here that were way beyond our pay grade. So you need to, to collaborate, involve people. One of the lessons we learned is it's not enough to go in and you think, okay, we'll build some schools, we'll build some hospitals, we'll improve health care in this area. Um, that sounds good, but if you don't involve those communities in the decision making as to how you're going to go about doing that and what they think they need, you're kidding yourself. And I think that was one of the harshest lessons learned back in the, in the 90s. I think it's one of the big tragedies of most, so many of these foreign <laughs> aid programs in these countries is people go in there with great intentions, but you need to work with those people. They have their dignity involved. And the leaders of the local community don't want suddenly somebody coming in from the outside and telling them how they should run their, uh, their village or their town. So there are a lot of lessons that, that are needed in that, in that time zone that are, that are hard.
Um, I'm just going to finish up very quickly with the board of directors and corporate governance, and, and we're running way beyond what I thought we would, so I'll try and do this fairly quickly. Um, uh, you hear a lot about boards today and their role. Uh, I try to simplify it. What a board really should be focused on is the quality of that CEO. I say hire and fire. Uh, obviously, the senior team is involved there, but that the, the, stop, the buck stops the CEO. Uh, the strategy of the company, is it a reasonable strategy, and does it make sense, and is it well communicated and well understood, both by the workforce, but also by the invest, investment community. And then obviously have a role with respect to the governance of the, uh, of the organization, the quality of the financial statements and those things. But uh, if you get the first two right, uh, the third should come. I want to try to open it up now to Q&A. The last slide I put up is, uh, uh, is something, uh, the other book that I really like. Uh, it's uh, uh, The Code of the West, what uh, Wall Street, or the ethics of Wall Street, uh, um, I'm sorry. Uh, cowboy ethics, what Wall Street could learn from the Code of the West, and this is the Code of the West. I, I like to joke about it. Uh, read through this. Uh, if you get a chance to get the book, you can read it in about two hours. It's a wonderful book. It's got a lot of nice pictures in it. Uh, but, it's, but it's very simple things. It's like the Ten Commandments of Business. And if you look at these and think about them, uh, they're very simple, and they can guide you uh, through all kinds of, of uh, difficult situations. So, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, living each day with courage, uh, do what has to be done. Uh, when you make a promise, keep it. I mean, this is pretty basic stuff. Uh, but it applies to our lives every day. So I like to say it's the, it's the Ten Commandments of Business for me. Uh, take a look at it as we, as we talk. I talked way too long. I apologize for that. Uh, but why don't we open it up and, and uh, we got about 20 minutes, is that right? 15 minutes? And uh, any topic that you, uh, that you find interesting, let's throw it out and see what the reactions are. Um, so my question is, what's your experience at Newmont with private military and private security organizations and how do you think that relationship should play out in the corporate world? Yeah. Good question. Uh, tough issue, uh, and one that, uh, again, management has to be really, really on. Uh, we did not use private armed private security, and we were in some areas that, uh, frankly, that was what, was what was recommended. The key thing here is to develop as good a relationship as you can with the local authorities, uh, police or military, depending on the country you're in. Uh, there's a lot of work that's been done in the last five, seven years uh, by, uh, in, in our case, in our industry case, International Council of Metal and Mining, uh, working with, with some of the uh, information that's come out of the, or the guidance that's come out of the United Nations. But, uh, but there's a basic decision that has to be made right up front if you're in a, if you're in a conflict area. Uh, security of your employees is paramount. Uh, so there's going to be a basic decision as to whether you, uh, you hire armed guards or not. Uh, our choice was to, uh, to try to work with the local military. That's, that sounds easy in a lot of those cases. The, you know, in a lot of these countries, you, you have to understand that the, uh, the military or the local police are a for-profit enterprise, so you can con instantly be put in conflict with some other values that you have as an organization. But, uh, tough area, one that takes a lot of judgment, and, and one where principles have to be well understood throughout the organization. There's one way up there. So if someone's interested in that or resource as well, do you recommend that they go directly into corporate or maybe start out an investment bank covering natural resources coverage? Uh, you know, I think, I think either way, I think, uh, you know, as a financial person, uh, probably going the financial route is the, is the easiest way. So investment banking or, uh, you know, working in one of the uh, large accounting or consulting firms uh, is, a, is, is clearly a, a route. If you're a technical person, 
uh, or you have a technical <laughs> undergraduate and, and the uh, operations side appeals to you, I think that's, uh, that's a good route to, uh, to go direct then. I mean, that, they, uh, for example, the major oil companies have incredible training programs where they hire in you know, highly competent people and, and uh, make sure they get uh, a variety of experiences over the first 10 years of their career. Uh, and again, there, you, you, there's, a, there's a quick split there. Are you willing to, uh, to go to remote locations, to operate internationally? Do you want to stay uh, more domestic or offshore? There's some decisions to be made. Uh, but, I th but I think there's two tracks there. You, you mentioned working in Uzbekistan a couple times. What was it like working in the post-Soviet world? <laughs> Newman in, uh, got involved in Uzbekistan in, uh, right at the time of the breakup of the Soviet Union. The largest open pit gold mine in the world is in uh, Uzbekistan. It's a huge pit. It's about three miles wide by five miles long. And, and uh, you know, more than 1,000 feet deep. Uh, they did not have the technology to process low-grade ore. So we entered into a very, uh, a very simple joint venture with the government. Basically, uh, they had stockpiled this low-grade ore. These were stockpiles that were uh, 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 about 200 meters, meters high, covered square miles. It's a lot of ore out there. We built the plant that crushed it and, and, uh, and processed the ore. Uh, we put the money in to do that, and we split the profits 50-50. It's a very straightforward deal. We financed the project through a multilateral agency. Uh, we insisted that the governing documents uh, be um, under the laws of a neutral country and be subject to international arbitration. Tough, tough negotiations. Um, Made a lot of trips there, uh, putting together the agreements. Ultimately, it was the first major investment done in the former Soviet Union. It's about a, about a $350 million plant. Uh, we operated successfully for about 10 years. Uh, we were running through the material. It had about a 14-year life, life uh, expectancy. We were getting to the, those last four years actually had some of the best grade and would have been some of the most profitable. That project to go into it because we knew it was going to be difficult, we demanded a very high rate of return in our analysis internally. And this kind of straightforward split in the profit with the government worked out well. It met our criteria. It was a plus 30% rate of return project. But if it wasn't, you wouldn't go in there. It was really tough to operate there. Building the plant was tough. Uh, you couldn't get materials in because we were bringing it down from Finland down through, the, uh, through Russia into Uzbekistan. We had to, we had to uh, weld the boxcars box doors shut. Otherwise, when the, when the train arrived, there wouldn't be anything in there. I mean, that was a very difficult time in the former Soviet Union. Uh, Condoleezza Rice refers to, uh, uh, to Russia today as uh, is the country of, uh, of uh, gangster capitalism. Uh, it was very much that back in that time period. Um, but we got through it. We operated. Uh, it was very hard. Uh, the, employee, the workforce there were used to the Russian way of, uh, of maintaining a plant, which meant you just ran it until it broke, and then you tried to figure out how to fix it. So putting in a program of preventive maintenance was, was a fight. Uh, but we got there. Budgeting was very difficult uh, because under the uh, old rules in the Soviet Union, if you didn't hit your budget, you, broke the, it was, you were breaking a law. It took us a while uh, to get that through our heads. We operated with a, a board of directors that was 50% Uzbek and 50% uh, uh, Newmont management. You know, we like to set budgets that, are, you know, that have a little bit of stretch in them. That was always a fight. Um, but things seemed to go well. You know, uh, we were able to export the gold and, and uh, turn it into hard cash and, and split the profits, and they seemed happy, and we did. 
but Uzbekistan started out after the breakup of the Soviet Union saying that they were, um, you know, they were going to go towards a free market economy. Uh, the president of the country, they put in, you know, they had elections. Uh, the president of the country, who happened to be the, uh, the former uh, head of the Communist Party in that country, uh, he was supposed to have two, I think, five-year terms. Uh, 22 years later, he's still president. He still miraculously gets 98% of the vote. Uh, after about 10 years, they kind of got tired of our ideas of how, how we should deal with the workforce. Uh, they got very upset with uh, first the UK and the European Union and then the United States because our governments insisted on human rights. Uh, it, was a, it was a difficult time. Ultimately, I got a fax uh, asking me to come over and was told that uh, uh, our joint venture was bankrupt, that I should just assign our 50% over to the Soviet, to the uh, Uzbek government. Um, so it's not bankrupt, we're doing very well. We're, look at the cash flow we're generating. So you don't understand. Uh, the authorities have done a tax audit. You own billions of dollars, and by the way, you've been polluting the desert for years, and uh, if you don't assign this over, uh, we'll force it into bankruptcy. Uh, very difficult last year and a half of my career was negotiating our way out of that deal. But that stuff still happens today. And it happens to major companies. So risk mitigation in that case was having uh, project financing, which still wasn't paid off, so I could get a lot of help out of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And international arbitration, ultimately, which they totally ignored, ultimately we got to a point where we could put a lien on a, they had five 767, Boeing 767s in the national, in the, uh, national airline, and they would fly into uh, uh, Frankfurt and, um, and uh, Heathrow. And ultimately, we put a lien on one of those planes, and that's when we finally got them to the bargaining table. So some of the stuff about being uh, tough but fair uh, certainly was required there. Right here. Um, just like over the years and in your experience with the developing world, if you will, have you found it it's easier to get business done today than it was, you know, 20 plus years ago, or, or is it still a work in progress? Uh, it's very much a work in progress. I think uh, what, we're, what you're seeing in the world now is a lot more nationalization. And uh, uh, agreements are getting you can go in and you can do an agreement with a country, uh, but circumstances change. And even though you may have an agreement that's supposed to run 20 years, uh, there's, there'll be great pressure to, to change it. Uh, right now, we're seeing that in Indonesia. I mean, this is uh, uh, Freeport McMoran, which is a large operator of copper mine there. Uh, Newmont has a large copper gold mine there. Um, that's done under, under Indonesian law in something called a contract to work. And it's a, it's a contract that lays out all the fiscal terms, all the, all the requirements on the company, uh, training programs. It's, it's a very comprehensive document. Uh, but the Indonesian government has decided, the current government, that they wanted a bigger piece of the action. They wanted to change the tax regime. And when you're making these investments, remember, you're making an investment that's going to be there for 25, 30 years. So you really want to na nail down uh, the terms and conditions up front with the governments. But uh, both Freeport and Newmont have been shut down over there because the government uh, has wanted to impose uh, new taxes and royalties above, above the level. And these are, not, uh, you know, these are not sweetheart deals. They were negotiated with very, very bright, intelligent people on the other side of the table and provided a lot of benefits. But once you're invested, uh, and you have a, you know, we can't just get up and leave the next day. Uh, we, we're putting in hundreds, or in that case, billions of dollars worth of assets. Uh, and that's why risk mitigation is so important. So it, it ebbs and flows. Uh, Colorado School of Mines has done a number of studies on, on what, uh, what are fair tax rates, what are, what, are, what are reasonable conditions to operate, and a lot of, a lot of uh, 
developing countries, uh, departments of mines and minerals or petroleum will, will look to those studies when you're negotiating. But uh, uh, those are, those are uh, uh, that, that still continue, continues to be a problem. The other problem is corruption. And it's, you know, people don't like to talk about it, but it's out there. And it's out there at every level, at some of the highest levels. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's in some countries that you'd be surprised at. I mean, you know, there's, everybody knows about the things that went on in Indonesia and Nigeria and some of these places. But it, it hits you in a lot of different ways in a lot of different places. And it's hard to see sometimes. You, can, you don't really recognize it at first. Uh, but it's there. And it's, a, uh, it's something you have to be constantly vigilant about and, and have your employees be vigilant. Okay. In your industry, the natural resource industry, obviously you deal with not only natural patients, but the, you know, the issue of uh, eco terrorists, uh, environmentalists, everything else. How, I mean, as a company, a corporate, how do you strategize for that? What do you put in place? How do you address that routinely? That's sort of part one. Part two is um, as also you know, responsible corporations. So how do you wrestle with sustainability aspects? So you're going through and you're obviously harvesting natural resources. How does the company look at that sustainability level of, you know, beyond you know, 50 years, et cetera? Right, right. It's a, uh, you know, it, it, it's a uh, good question. Very, very, again, tough area, but one that, uh, you know, in our case, quickly we, uh, we established a policy that on the environmental side that we would meet the environmental standards of the country that we are operating in or the United States of America, whichever was the most difficult. So you start to raise the bar right away. And uh, as an industry, uh, in the late 90s, we looked very hard at this, and that's what we formed this uh, International Council of Metal and Mining, and we involved uh, environmental groups, NGOs. Um, uh, the environmental side, in, in, in a lot of ways, is the easiest because there's science involved in that, and uh, there's standards out there that are, that are well recognized, and you, you, know, you can build to those standards. And if you, especially when you're building new projects, you can do it right up front. So that's that, the very difficult areas is dealing with communities, as I talked about before, and how you relate to that. The sustainability side is, is vitally important. Uh, you make a big commitment, and the best security you can have in, in one of these countries is if that mine, in our case, is viewed as an Indonesian mine or an Uzbek mine. So we minimize the number of expatriates, we maximize the number of, of local employees in those operations. So the training and development is key, both at the, you know, at the, at the uh, uh, trade level, but also in management and really promoting those people uh, you know, we were fortunate we operated for a long, or we operate in, in Peru. Uh, Peru has a long history of mining, and they've got excellent engineering schools down there. So mining engineers were, were easy to hire there. And then it's important that you have programs. Um, uh, you know, so that buy-in is, is vitally important. Uh, sourcing as many things as you can locally. So, and, and creating many industries. So, you know, everybody wears a uniform in a mine. We're a pretty regimented group. Uh, getting those uniforms uh, sewn, in some cases, I know in Indonesia we had villages where, where, where there were people still using uh, sewing machines that they would pedal with their feet because there was no electricity there uh, initially. And uh, having them do, uh, uh, do the uniforms, uh, buying as many foodstuffs as you can locally. I mean, it's just the whole supply chain. You look at it and say, what can we do or cause to be done locally uh, that will allow us to, uh, uh, to develop uh, the support industries that we need? Okay. Thank you.
two things real quick. First, I'd like to thank Mr. Murdy for uh, his uh, words of wisdom. And I think one of the things that I hope you took away from this is your background. I mean, often I deal with many of you students that come in, you're, you're concerned about your future. You're trying to make those decisions on the career paths and jobs and everything else. I think there was a valuable, uh, important lesson here. I mean, you can start off as a marketing major, go into accountancy, dabble in finance. Those are all fundamentals of business that you're all going to get exposed to. And as you go through your career, especially early on, you're going to be able to make those changes and formulate different areas. But the key is, is once you start going down those paths, learn your organization in depth, you know, and, and gain appreciation. And if it doesn't fit, you move on. But there's no right answer right out of the gate, okay? And I think this is a prime example if you look at uh, Mr. Murdy's career, uh, how things can go. So on that note, again, thank you, Mr. Murdy, and here's a little keepsake. Part two, don't go anywhere.